So our wedding Lowry was miraculously saved and healed from what should have been a deadly overdose in 1991. She used drugs. She used drugs and alcohol again from that moment. She never used drugs and alcohol again from that moment. And then um <clears throat> She's been fighting for sobriety for eight years, and she has been in the passionate pursuit of her a healer, Jesus Christ. And from that day, committed her life to immediately to help him rescue others trapped in bondage. And she has over 30 years of ministry with the most difficult types of people, and recently started out her ministry partner, Tatiana Hart, and Seven Bells Refuge. Together, they proclaim the word to those in crisis and do prayer ministry to help them to get free from what they have trapped them in sin. And she currently lives in Brunswick, Minnesota with her husband, Kevin. And uh, when, Wendy, when Wendy Lowry means the world, Wendy Lowry means the world to uh, our pastor Tang. In 2003, she was the one who visited him weekly in the county jail, sharing about the love of Christ and about Teen Challenge. When it was time to sentence Tang to 10 years in prison for armed robbery, Wendy Lowry came to his sentencing day and stood up in front of court and fought for Pastor Tang. Because of her tenacity and strong faith in the Lord, instead of going to prison for 10 years, Pastor Tang got the chance to go to the Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge Program and graduated. The rest was history. Life of Christ Church. Let's give a warm welcome to Wendy Lowry. deliverance meetings that were going on 
and if somebody was demonized and they could not figure out where to get free, somehow Tang Bu had this thing going on where you sent them to him and he would get people free. So he was right in the trench almost right away. And then came to start pastoring. Basically my relationship with Tang at this point is when Tang says jump, I say how high. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm so amazed by him. And there, I've been in ministry a long time and I've met a lot of people in high places in ministry. But there are few that hold the level of respect that I have for Tang. Very few because I know the challenge, some of the challenges he has faced from the beginning, from when I met him, just a great respect for Bumsa, who I'm always trying to lure into the high area. You know, we were talking about him with someone yesterday saying, how do we get Bumsa involved what we're, in what we're doing? So another young man I have great respect for who is going down the same path as Tang, just very serious about Jesus Christ. So. I um, kind of follow one track. I have basically one passion in different ways of putting it, but this past February 16th, I celebrated 31 years of being free from some really chronic and deadly addictions. And 31 years of knowing Jesus Christ as everything. He is absolutely everything everything to me. And I can honestly say at this point in my life that standing for Jesus Christ and standing for the cross and standing for what can happen in a life from the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the power that that gives and the cleansing that that gives the most wicked of people, which I was, is worth losing everything. It's worth losing money, your reputation, respect. It's worth losing it all. I can't imagine not doing exactly this, which is standing for Jesus. And I respect those who do the same, who will not compromise him in any way. My testimony is stunning. I'm reminded often that I am a rare one because many end up dying in their sin. Many can even come to Christ, but still end up dying in their sin. Many simply die in their sin. And I was one who should have many times actually before it actually came to that date. But for some reason, the God of the universe chose to save me. And I was not someone that anyone else would have thought, pick her. There is absolutely no reason you should have done that. By my mid-teens, I was pretty emotionally disturbed. No one knew that because it just wasn't. I'm from a Norwegian family, and you don't talk about your feelings. So I, I think I couldn't even understand the level of anger and rage I was struggling with. Certainly a, a terrible, crippling problem with anxiety and abandonment. And I was without Christ. I had no idea I could be saved. I ran away from home at 16. I always intended to be good because I felt so bad. I felt so evil that I felt like if I do good, maybe I won't feel so bad. And so all through high school, I kept good morals. I didn't use drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I always saw those who did as the losers in school, not recognizing that the pride in that position is actually more wicked than anything they were doing. I had kept, there was a religious belief in my childhood that I certainly never doubted there was a God. I didn't doubt I was going to meet him, but I also knew completely that I was going to hell because I was just a bad person. And as bad as that lie is to believe, it isn't nearly as bad as those who believe that they're good people. Because now I've run into a lot of them, and they are far more trapped than I was. Because they think they're good, and something about that goodness means they don't have to go to the foot of the cross and fall on their face. Me, at least I knew that. I knew that I, something drastic would have to happen for me to be able to know Jesus. I didn't even know you could know Jesus, to be honest. At almost 18 years old, 
I compromised all of my standards because a friend, my best friend's father gave me a drink called a grasshopper. It was an ice cream drink and I knew there was alcohol in that drink. And I wrestled with that decision because I knew I'd made vows to never drink because I'd see the impact of it on my family. And it was always told to us through school, if you drink, you're going to end up in jail. You'll end up dead, you'll kill people. And I thought, I'm never gonna drink, I'm bad enough. But when I drank, my anxiety left me. I suddenly had courage. I suddenly could be around people. And I thought, well, this had a different impact on me. I don't know what those people are drinking, but whatever it was, they should drink this because this had a really different impact. The problem was I couldn't stop because that was the only way I was okay was to drink. So I went from none of this to falling deep into sin within a couple of weeks because I couldn't stop drinking. I would say at the beginning it was I wouldn't stop drinking because I loved the impact on me. I loved that I wasn't in torment, that I wasn't being terrorized by my own head. I started smoking almost right away. I became involved with a completely different group of people that were involved in crime. I was participating in a lot of things that were hard to believe. I was um, right away into the clubs. I was going to clubs almost every night. I ended up getting a, kind of a pair of eating disorders that bounced back and forth that were just crippling to my health. And then eventually that moved into an amphetamine addiction because of the drinking. I couldn't stop at all. I couldn't stop during the day. I couldn't stop on the weekend. I couldn't ever stop because I would go into these shakes and I would get sick. And I basically had to keep drinking just to keep functioning almost right away. I didn't go on binges. I stayed on one binge for eight years and I never sobered up at all. I was suicidal much of that time because I was in such great bondage that I had all these different steps all through the day that I had to figure out how to manage because if I didn't, I was going to become violently sick and felt that I would end up taking my life. And if I ended up taking my life, I would go to hell sooner. I knew one thing, I was going to hell. And I had to make this work somehow so that I could have one more day, one more day, one more day, not in hell where I knew I deserved to be. I was very manic. Um, people describe, back then they didn't talk about mental illness, but I, I look at diagnoses now and I think I've had pretty much everything that I see. But I got addicted to rock and roll music, loud nightclubs, and I got lost in this darkness, this life hanging out with very unsafe people. I cared about no one. I didn't care about myself. I didn't care about anyone else. I cared about who's going to buy my liquor, who's going to get my drugs. That's what I cared about, is always looking ahead to where I was planning. Truthfully, I'm shocked that I lived as long as I did. I made daily choices that should have cost me my life, certainly should have cost other people their life. That was kind of the group of people I was in, all of us. Are, at any moment, something could have happened that people would have died. Most people expected that actually and a lot of my friends have passed away over the years and especially back then there's long periods of that time where i don't even remember anything i don't know what happened i people have said you should write a book but i can't write a book because i don't even know what happened so my version of what i think happened i have heard multiple times is not true so i my mind would create a script which actually favored me a little because I couldn't believe how I was living. So I can't really write a book because I believed what I would tell myself. I don't know if anyone else has that problem, but I did. And so I couldn't ever quite figure out what the real story was. I had a problem with what's real and what's not real from way back at the beginning of my addictions. I was very socially phobic and so that's why I had to use tremendous amounts of chemicals to be living the lifestyle I did. but. Because I was so damaged emotionally, I was incapable of having real relationships. I was disillusioned and damaged because my father had always rejected me. He lived in our home, but he didn't have a relationship with me. 
and I never found out to the end of his life why, but at that time I had no idea why. I just knew that he didn't want me. And so that was very hard for me because he lived in our home and ignored me. I was never engaged, married. I never even lived with a man prior to getting married when I was 42 years old for the first time. I couldn't stand being around people for very long, and it was not because I was a good person. I was the opposite of that. I just didn't like people. I wanted them to give me things, but I didn't like them. I hated myself. How could I like someone else? I was paralyzed by sinful vows that I'd made all of my life that I'm never going to love or be loved because to me it stood for something that was incredibly painful. I was in a virtual emotional prison, tiny little box inside myself. And I had no idea who that person was. I was violently assaulted and nearly murdered when I was 24 years old, and I imploded. What was left of me imploded at that time. I actually asked this person to take my life because I knew I wasn't going to recover. I rejected myself fully at that point. I couldn't even stand touching myself. I was so destroyed by that. And it was so pathetic what started to happen because when you lose your will to live, your body starts to die and that's what happened to me. Many people would sit in the clubs with me smoking, drinking, and absolutely zero faith, but they would beg me to go to church because they thought, you're gonna die, you're, you're dying. They could see that, they were begging me to go to church because they believed me when I said I was going to hell. They knew I was probably right. But the problem is when I was sitting in bars listening to people that were drinking, using drugs, smoking, swearing, doing all the things I was doing, and they're telling me to go to God to get well, I'm thinking, how foolish are you? If this really would work, why haven't you done it? Show me somebody that actually worked for, and no one could tell me anyone. They, they couldn't give me a person to go to and say, this actually happened to me. No one did that. They just said, well, maybe you won't go to hell, though. And I thought, I really lost complete respect for a lot of my friends at that point because I thought, how, how can you sit here and dangle this thing in front of me when you have no proof and you don't even know, you can't even stop smoking. Why would you try to lure me into this, another hopeless end? I went to about 12 churches to check out what they said in the town I was in. I went to 12 churches during the day, completely high and drunk, asking to see the pastor and saying, is it possible for me to be saved? Well, they would see how intoxicated and high I was and they would say, I'm gonna take you to the hospital and I'll come visit you when you're sober. 12 times that happened to me and I decided my friends are wrong. I can't be saved. I'm going to have to be sober to be saved. The problem is I can't get sober. I knew in my life there was no chance of me getting sober because I can't live with my own head. So I knew I was definitely, according to now 12 pastors and everyone who had shared that Jesus was the way, that he wasn't. He wasn't the way for me. I lost hope that God could help me, and I was so sick by then I could barely stand up. I was shaking all the time. I was sitting in front of space heaters with blankets around me, just shaking, throwing up. I was very dehydrated. People were alarmed. I mean, everyone could see what was happening, but I wasn't going to go to the hospital. And most of the people who are like, like me agree, don't, unless, don't take her there unless she wants to go there because she'll probably end her life. I, two of my friends eventually forced me to go to urgent, well, they were going to take me to the ER, but they took me to urgent care when I said, I'll, I'll go to urgent care, I'm not going to the ER. The doctor asked me what was wrong because I was shaking so hard, and I told him I was having a mental breakdown because I didn't know how to explain the shaking. And he said, are you um, addicted to chemicals? And I said, no. I socially drink because I was concerned I might smell like alcohol, so I said, I do socially drink but I'm not addicted. So then he wondered, well, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And he said, there's something more seriously wrong here because I wasn't the right color for sure. I was already, um, I was becoming some jaundice color. And he said, I'm gonna make an appointment for you to see me next week. 
but I said, I need sedatives. I need to be able to rest. I want to be able to sleep. And he gave me a prescription for opiates. At that time, they weren't so regulated like they are now, and it had four refills, and I walked out the door with that prescription. I was not one who took opiates. I did not want a downer. I wanted amphetamine. So it wasn't something that I was planning to use unless I had to. But there was nothing at this point that I knew could help me. My little sister, six years younger than me, she was in also in a real wreck of a life. And she laid down one night and she said, God, if you can take this torment from me, I will give my life to you and she went to sleep and when she woke up in the morning she was a completely different person she came up to where i was living and she just kind of sat with me and she just said i i'm going to help you i just you've got to stop talking because i can't handle all the profanity i can't handle this stuff coming out your mouth i gave my life to god i can't take that language anymore so please stop talking by that time, I was having a hard time even understanding simple conversation because my mind wasn't working well enough to where I could hear people talk to me and be able to figure out what they were saying. It was almost like everyone was talking to me in a foreign language. But I would try to understand, but I just couldn't follow conversations. She took me to, she had found a pastor in that town that was helping her. And it was the Assemblies of God pastor in Albert Lee, Minnesota. His name was Lauren Molesness. His wife was Barb Molesness. She took me to him because she was scared. She knew I wasn't going to live much longer. And he's feverishly explaining something to me, and I'm figuring out that it must be about God again. He's trying to tell me that God can save me, but I can't figure out what he's saying exactly, but I, I assumed he was talking about God. But I thought, this man doesn't know everything that's going on with me. If I told him, he's going to agree with the other 12 that, yeah, you're going to have to go get sober first. So he said to me when I finally said, Sir, I can't understand anything you're saying to me. Like, you don't have to keep going. I'm not going to be able to pick it up. And he looked at me and he said, Don't worry about that. Jesus Christ can cut right through that. And that hit me in the head so hard that I felt like, I say a bullet or a rock hit me right in the head. I couldn't, I just was stunned. I sat there like, <sighs> I don't know what just happened, but something just like a rock just flew into my head. And I, I left there. He took my hand and prayed with me, but I don't really know what that was either. I don't remember. And I left there though with this one sentence. Don't worry about that. Jesus Christ can cut right through that. And I thought, what did that even mean? I don't even know what that meant. But it didn't leave me. It just kept going around in my head. But the problem was I was too sick to keep living. I was so physically sick that I just knew there's, I've really probably got limited time left. And when it gets this bad, it's, I just can't even explain how physically that became. So I just knew that I was going to take control of this process because of how terrible it was. And I, my last lie that I believe was hell can't be worse than this. Hell is a lot worse than that. But at the time, I just couldn't. Like, I, I was so sick. On that Friday night, I took the overdose that I had already secured from the doctor. And I also mixed it with quite a bit of alcohol because I knew, I knew I wasn't going to, I knew I wasn't going to survive this. I knew I wasn't going to survive anyway. I just knew I couldn't, I couldn't go on any longer. I'm driving away from where I was because I didn't want someone calling the police. And I was pulled over. I've been pulled over many times, but this time the police officer really didn't talk to me that much. I don't even know that he really did a lot of the the roadside stuff with me. He just put me in the front of his car and he took me to the police station and he was talking to me and I just don't even know what I said back. I just remember seeing his face. Like, it was like horrified. I don't even know what I was saying to him. Honestly, I have no idea. Whatever it was, I'm getting it out of my 
chest, whatever I needed to say at that point, I was unloading it on him. He calls in other people who then do the trying to figure out what exactly has she taken. And he's had them call my family to come get me immediately to take me to the hospital. And I just remember his face when he walked out the door and other people start rushing in. My sister picks me up almost right away. I don't even know what time in the night this was. It was, you know, way after midnight, but I don't know when. My sister picks me up, but I made her take me back to where I was staying because I needed my bottle of alcohol. I was like, I can't start shaking. I have to have that if I'm gonna go for a car ride with you somewhere. And so I go get, take, I told her I needed something. I don't even remember what, but I got the bottle. She takes me to her pastor's house again. His wife and he gets, I don't even know what time that was, but she gets them up. I want to mention about that police officer. I shared my story a couple years later, and I could see a man standing straight ahead of me, clear out the back. It was at a big church in that city. And when I walked to the back, this man stepped up to me, and he held out his hand, but his hand was shaking so hard that I thought, he must have anxiety like I do. But he grabbed my hand, and he was just staring at me, and he said, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And he said, I was the police officer that picked you up that night. He said, when I saw your name on the flyer, he said, I thought, I've got to come see if, who that is. There cannot be two girls in this town named Wendy Torvalson. He said, I couldn't believe it. He said, I've been haunted by that night. I was sure you had died that night. So, I... My sister has me at the pastor's house. The pastor takes my sister away. He doesn't want her present. He sees what's happening. His wife, she carried me down her basement, into her basement, and she said, this is, she told me later, that's where I meet God. And she, my sister said, don't pray in the spirit. She hasn't heard that. She doesn't know what that is. It'll really freak her out. And so by this time, I don't really have any consciousness anyway so it's not like I'm processing what's going on she gives a longer version of how ghastly that really was she said you had your hands up in the air you were I was begging her to pull me out she said I feel very certainly that you your feet at least were in hell like you could feel something that was so terrifying that I was begging her to help me and to pull me out at that point, she said, she started praying in the spirit because she didn't know what else to do. She said it was as if she knew if Jesus didn't come right at that moment, she, I was going to die right in front of her. So she's wailing. For some reason, I started to hear this wailing. And I could hear this loud crying. And then I could hear words, but I didn't know the words. They were like some other language. I didn't know that at the time. I just knew I didn't know what the words were, except it started to get clearer. Come to me, little girl. Little girl, come to me. Come to me, little girl. And I have no idea how to really explain that, except that God went past my brain into my spirit and talked to me. And I heard him, and... I responded to him without mentally understanding what was happening and she says at that time all she knew was God asked her to say, tell her to say I renounce you Satan and I did and she said I went completely limp. She said everything stopped, you went completely limp and you were just laying there. She said I couldn't even tell if you were breathing, you were so still. So she thought I was dead, and then she said God gave her a flash in her mind of when he would touch the demoniac, the people that were demonized, and, and they would be freed, and then they would look as if they were dead. And so she said, okay. She went upstairs, started cleaning her house, and she said she didn't come back down because she didn't know what to do. But the pastor brought my sister back, and she goes down and shakes me and picks me up. And I was completely healed. I was, I was completely healed in every way. I was completely healed. I was completely a different person. I not only wasn't 
and never went through any withdrawal, but I also never used drugs and alcohol. I didn't smoke again. I didn't even know I smoked. I tell people I had this dip in my finger and I was always looking at it like, what happened there? I, it was like callous and I couldn't figure out what did I use my finger for that made it like that. Anyway, I just never knew I smoked. It was gone out of my head. But I also didn't use profanity. I talked totally different. Like it scared people so bad. They were so scared of me that nobody wanted to be around me. But I didn't care because I was dumbfounded. I was like, the peace of God that passes all understanding. I had that. I just don't even know how to explain it. When you go from a whole life of torment and torture mentally to it's just peaceful in there. There's no voices. There's no, it's just completely peaceful. And I, I tell people I could have grown another limb and it wouldn't have been as miraculous as the calmness in my mind. I just couldn't even believe that I had a calm mind. So like all these other things that I was healed from almost seemed like nothing compared to I can think. I can actually think. I can sleep. I can eat. I've never had a life like this. So I had one obsession after like 20. Who touched me? Who talked to me when I was almost dead? So I pursued the one who healed me because someone thought I was worth something, but I couldn't figure out what happened. So I obviously had been arrested that night and I ended up going through kind of a court process and the Rule 25 assessor actually said, I don't understand this police report and this, like, this does not match. It was a week after and I'm like, I don't know what happened. I honestly don't know what happened. She says, you don't know what happened? I said, no, some pastor's wife prayed for me and this is what happened. And she said, you've been born again. I've seen this before. So I learned I was born again from my Rule 25 assessor. So then she said, well, this presents a problem for me because she said, I've known about you for a long time. She says, I don't want you mixed up. I want you to have a chance. I want you to be able to live. I want to see if you can make it. She said, I'm not going to send you to treatment. I want you to stay in the church. I want to see if... I don't want to mix two things together and confuse you. I want you to make it. So she says, I'm not sure how I'm going to tell your judge how to say this, but she said that I, I, got it, I, need, I feel it, that I need to help you. So when I'm sentenced, I pled guilty. I, didn't even, I, knew, I don't even know what happened that night. The judge said, I agree with that. He said, I, I want to see if you can make it too. This will not work for your friends, he said. Tell your friends, don't come in here and say you've been born again and that you don't want to go to treatment. But he said, if you stay in the church and I'll be checking on you and you don't come back in front of me, he said, I won't send you to treatment. I never came back in front of him. And I never went to treatment. Had not someone cared that I was lost and really made some drastic steps towards me, I would be in my 31st year of hell right now. So the way I look at life is, it's, it's not for me to sit here and play around with eternity and act like I've got, I can make my own agenda work here. I can do a lot of things, I know that. I'm a, a very ambitious person, I'm a passionate person, but my life is not my own. And one day I will answer for every extra day that God gave me, and I don't wanna to have to stand there and say, thank you for healing me, but, and nothing. Because everybody has that story. You maybe didn't almost die, but every single day we have, we are not owed, and someone else isn't getting one. My life verse is Acts 20, 24. It says, my life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about God's wonderful kindness and love. And as Christians, 
That's our assignment, all of us. All of us are to go and tell others. But the problem is, many don't do that. I was fortunate that I had people that jumped in front of me, that believed for me when I didn't believe for myself. But there's a very small number of those people everywhere I go that actually feel it's their responsibility to help others not go to an endless eternity in a lake of fire. We are to tell the good news of God's wonderful kindness and love for the most despicable people on this planet, which I qualified as. It is not hard for me to look at Tang Vu or others that I didn't see as nearly as wicked as I had been and say, I hope they get the same miracle I did. And I have seen many that have. Christians all over have dropped the ball. The world has evangelized the church and many churches look like the world. It's entertainment, it's, it's motivational, it's everything but telling people what happened on that cross and why, and that if you don't live the way that Jesus lived and asked us to live, you don't go to eternity with him. Most people believe if they say a little ask Jesus into my heart prayer, they're going to heaven. I'm serious. Most people actually think that and they continue living in sin. There's only one thing that God's interested in from us. And if we don't do it, we're useless to him. We're completely useless. There's only one thing that matters. And that is helping other people get to eternity safely. I remember hearing early in my years as a Christian about um, very visual parables I love. I love um, people who can put things into stories because I'm a visual thinker. And they talked about this drawer, a desk, like God sitting at his desk and he's got this pen drawer and he's got this drawer just jammed full of all these pens and they're like souvenir pens pens that do tricky things light up do fun things but there's three simple pens in the front of his drawer that he uses the rest he ignores because those three pens always work there he doesn't have to keep trying to get them to have ink there's a three they're the three dependable pens. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm left-handed. When I write, I drag over everything I write and smear everything, and it takes a special pen, usually a Sharpie. I connected to that, like, I know how hard it is to find a good pen. And so I thought, I want to be one of those three pens. I'm gonna strive to be one of those pens that whatever happens, I'm on. I'm ready. I'll say it, whatever it is that needs to be said. And that is the one goal that I have in my life, is to always be willing to share, no matter what's happening, no matter what comes my way. The sin of complacency is what is bringing America to a crashing end. In case you guys don't see it, it's crashing faster than most people can comprehend. But complacency is the calmness that many have. And I won't speak for the world, but I will speak for the church. The church is calm too. The church is very calm about what's happening to our country right now. Many care very little about anything unless it runs into their house and throws things around. That's the only time they really get excited about, wait a minute, I don't want them in my house. They get excited when it's causing them problems but until that point if it's not bumping into their comfortable life they're not really concerned about it they just turn off the news the last thing Jesus did before he ascended was to command all that were truly his followers to go into their world and share the gospel and he made no exceptions and I've heard people all my life tell me the exceptions if you're a follower of Jesus and you're going to heaven there are no exceptions it's all all means everyone. The truth is less than 1% of those who claim to be a Christian are actually engaged in doing that. Less than 1% who call themselves Christians. 
It's completely pointless to say I'm a Christian, which is a follower of Jesus, and not serve God with your full heart. To represent the one who has holes in his hands and in his feet, who bled out so that we could be free. We have no other way to get there. Why would we live out this life that he bought back for us and ignore him and let everyone else go lost? Imagine that a father speaks to his son one morning before he goes to work and he says, straighten your room, take out the garbage and sweep the driveway before I come home. And when he comes home, the son says, well, dad, the garbage is only half full. I figured nobody was gonna see it in my room, but I did clean the driveway as you asked. And I sort of straightened my room, but nobody's gonna see it. And that's how many people respond to God. We rationalize and argue instead of submit. We say, oh, why, that's not for me. I'm not gifted in that. Well, I'll tell you, I've got social anxiety that's second to none. But when your feet go into hell, you suddenly know there's something more important than staying quiet because I get nervous in front of people. I don't want to stand in front of God one day and say, yeah, well, you know, I shake when I'm in front of people. Because he would think, Okay, I'm comparing your shaking from nervousness to, oh, look, Jesus was murdered. There's just no excuse that's going to stand. I have a sign that I've kept on my wall at home that says, dying for me was the most Jesus could do. Living for him is the least I can do. And if we're truly a follower of Jesus, a genuine born-again believer, the light that is in us from the Holy Spirit will automatically dispel darkness when you walk into a room. Amen. The light of Jesus Christ will shine so brightly coming from you that all of those who are in sin, practicing sin, hiding sin, are going to get very nervous when you come around. Yeah. And if that doesn't happen, you need to examine the foundation of your salvation because that's what should happen. It's not just the death of Jesus for me. It is the life of Jesus from me that also needs to be seen. His death and his resurrection will signal salvation because the light coming from you is a candle on a hill. It will light up a room. Saved looks and talks. Saved. Charles Finney, 1792 to 1875, has been called one of the greatest evangelists, but his preaching was to those who profess to be Christians. He said back then, before 1875, that most people in the church are not living in a state of true salvation, and he felt his calling was to see so-called believers of his day actually converted to Christ because he didn't feel that they were by how they were living. And he spent his life preaching piercing salvation messages inside church buildings and Bible colleges. Many who thought they were saved were under a delusion because they were, they were, they were writing the definition themselves of what they felt saved should be, not what the Bible says saved is. A current leading evangelist, Ray Comfort, says, it's fairly common to hear someone give a testimony by saying something like this. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was a child. Then I fell away from the Lord and became involved in drugs, robbery, rape, murder, pornography, gambling, adultery, extortion, and other things that I would rather not mention. All this time, I still knew the Lord. Then I came back to him when I was 30 years old. He says, these words usually come from those who have no idea what the Bible speaks of as true salvation. Almost all of those we place in the category of backsliders are not backsliders. They never slid forward in the first place. They're false converts, stony ground or thorny ground hearers, as spoken of in Mark 4, 16 to 19. And when they fall into a time of temptation, tribulation or persecution following what they felt was salvation that grew sprouted they turn back and it talks about that in the Bible they didn't come to salvation they turned back for the world 
Backsliders don't just look back, they go back, showing that something was very wrong with whatever it was that they called salvation. Even now, currently, a huge number of people who attend church are told they're saved by their pastors, by other religious leaders, because they prayed a prayer, got confirmed, went to a Christian school, went to a Christian program, but clearly they are not saved. They are still living in sin and somehow being told they're still saved. They are not saved. The Bible doesn't give a reason for us to keep living in sin. It says we will stop. We will be tormented by it if we keep sinning. A truly saved person looks entirely different than what many who call themselves Christians in the church look like today. You're either walking as a new creature in love with Jesus Christ, or you are not. You are living your life to bless and honor the king, or you're living your life to bless and honor yourself. If you're not walking in, worshiping the king with your conduct and your choices all through the week, then don't assume you are saved. I don't care who tells you you're saved. The Bible doesn't support it. Another leading evangelist, Charles Spurgeon, says, I am told that Christians do not love each other. I'm very sorry if that be true, but I doubt it, for I suspect those who do not love each other are not Christians at all. He also says that if you're not interested in reaching the lost, it's doubtful that you're saved yourself. It's easy to appear to be a Christian within the church because the blessings of God often are on the church. Nobody walks in smoking crack, drinking out of their bottle, sitting sexually somewhere in the building. They don't watch porn generally when they're sitting in church. It's easy for everyone to look at all of us and feel amazed that we're sitting here quietly, all acting decent. But the expectations here require that. Don't mistake that, however, for genuine salvation in anyone's life. Your heart and what you think about is a better indicator of whether you're truly saved. What you talk about, what you live for, how you talk to and talk about others is a much greater indicator of who the Lord is of your life. Repentance is key. It has to be there for salvation to occur. That's what Jesus says. And many that I meet that say they're Christians and are not concerned about going to hell will say they've never had any sorrow over their sins, so they don't feel like they have to really move out of this certain relationship or sexual sin. They don't have any grief over it. God has not convicted me of it, so I'm not like, they don't have any issue with it. The problem is the Bible's very clear about sin, all of it. It says living for self is sin. Nothing will drive them to the foot of the cross and surrender because they don't feel convicted. They don't even have the Holy Spirit in them. They believe what someone has told them, that they're saved because of some prayer they said. Begging God to rid us of ourself, to destroy everything of self that's in us, that we have no passions left for self, to live for self. That's the desire that will lead to salvation. We should never, ever, ever think that something we do or say and shame the cross of Jesus Christ, we should be just broken over that. Many just discuss the world. We're trying to gain money, which has absolutely no value in eternity. They fail to realize Jesus was beaten to death for our compromise, for our love of self and gain and power until we realize this wickedness before God and we, we repent of it, we throw it down and abandon it, salvation will not occur. If we are not living near the Lord Jesus Christ and we don't have an appetite for the word, for spiritual things, for bringing others into the kingdom, and we don't feed upon him, that's not saved because saved will produce all of those things. If he did not put it into our hearts to long to know him better and have his very best, we as people would be satisfied with the very least and to be called saved. That's just how depraved we are. So if this hunger is not in you, you are disconnected from your creator. And that should greatly concern you because you are still a mission field. He's still trying to bring you to Christ. People want to appear good to the world around them. We want to use Jesus to help our image. But we don't want the obligations that our pastors have. We want the name of Jesus as our banner. 
We want it to make our businesses prosper and our agendas work. But God says this is a marriage. It's not dating. It's a marriage. We don't want to be totally locked into this commitment that will cost us our own personal passions. But God says this marriage will be acceptable to him only if we are dead to those things. We have to lay them down. Our greatest sin is our arrogance that he compromises. We do, but he does not, and he won't on the last day. It'll all be clear that day. He'll lay it all out, and we won't even have an argument. A spouse would never put up with the compromising that we do with God. They would run out long before. We just assume on him. We just assume. He gave up Jesus for me. He loves me. He'll bring me to heaven. I'm not as bad as some people. There's nowhere in the Bible that's written. The devil's very willing to bless and prosper us, to keep us deceived and thinking we're saved. He does not mind people saying they're Christians, as long as they don't go out and make any more. He'll keep you a very happy Christian, just don't go make more Christians. Steve Gallagher of Pure Life Ministries wrote on this very issue. He said, there's a stunning difference between a true believer and a non-believer. The true believer experiences a very dramatic inward change. The true believer has made, has made one choice to make every choice for Jesus Christ. We do it for relationships, so we know we can do it. So God knows he has created that desire and ability within us. We love to serve those we love. 1 John 3, 8 through 9 says, the one who practices sin is of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin as a lifestyle for very long. He hates it. In Mr. Gallagher's experience, he says that when a man draws his strength from his relationship with Christ, his long-standing growing love for God is displacing his idolatrous love for his sin and himself. He now hates both. The Bible refers to a group called Tares. This group is a religious experience group. They've had some kind of religious experience, but it never got to their heart. They believe for a while, and then in temptation, they fall away. They did not experience true salvation. They continue in the church alongside the true believers, even though they are not a believer. And they assume upon God's grace that whatever it was that they did that was a religious experience means they're saved. But the difference is in the heart. God says you will have a new heart. So if you don't have a new heart, then you aren't saved. It brings about a vivid transformation. The inner heart is where you find your emotions, feelings, affections, motives, and attitudes. And when regeneration happens, it's fixated on one, Jesus Christ. He enters into the deepest being of us, changes us, and makes it his holy of holies. And out of that we live. It affects everything about us. A truly saved person hates sin. He never wants to return to it. If he does, he's miserable, and he's looking for a way out right away. Eventually, he looks back. He's not falling into sin anymore. The greater desire is to know God better. That's what he lives for. And if that isn't you, examine the foundation of what you think is salvation. Because God has a golden rule. Love him most and love others more than yourself. And that is his one concern, that we are reaching others for eternity. He's reading our minds. He knows our motives. He knows exactly what we live for. And the world is constantly reaching into the church, trying to pull people's minds away with every kind of distraction, even busy, busy, busy church work. There's so many on committees, but when you say, how do you lead someone to Christ? They have no idea. The first thing everyone should know. Do people draw to you because you radiate Jesus Christ everywhere you go? Do they come to you for prayer because they see how passionately near to the King you live? Can your purpose in life be easily seen as trying to be Jesus Christ to everyone you meet in a day? You're not sorting people out by, I like them, not them. This isn't about being kind or having a good attitude because many of the lost are doing that same thing. They're kind. They have good attitudes but they're lost. People need to sense the presence of Jesus just being in the room with you because he's big enough to fill that entire room with one person. He's strong enough and he desires to have that much of us that we could walk into any place and everyone knows Jesus just came in the room. 
Or many say my testimony is a silent one. I'm not like you. I'm not that way. I'll tell you, I would be the first to be a silent one, except I can't keep this from bursting out of me. I was terrified of what was about to come for me. And most people will say, I'm glad that didn't happen to me, but I wish it would happen to everyone because then there'd be more people going to heaven in the end. Our spirits are so full of ourselves. Our prayers are all about ourselves, what we need, what our family needs, but not the list of people that we know that are lost, that are dying in their sin, our neighbors who don't know Jesus. We just talk endlessly about issues, hurts, and why others are called to these certain things, but not us. Great Comfort again tells of Christians they give him all these excuses of why they're not called to witness Christ to others. And then he says, I will pay you $1,000 cash per person that you share Jesus Christ with today. And immediately they want to know the details. Wait, what? How do I do it exactly? What do I have to say? They were not willing to witness for Jesus to keep people out of hell. But the second there's cash money involved, they want to know exactly what do I do? How do I do it? What counts as, as finished? He says immediately they want to know how to witness. And that is sadly the state of many. Money is the currency of many. We have got to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus Christ. And low self-esteem is no excuse. Many of us will qualify for that. But it isn't an excuse to let people go to hell. We need to stop dwelling on all of our weaknesses, our pains. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, the more broken we are, the more amazing Jesus looks coming out of our mouth. Amen. Jesus' life was terrible. He never drove around how terrible his earthly life was that he chose to come to. He made it the lowest experience possible. But he didn't care. He knew his home eternally was in heaven. And he wanted us with him. That's why he came. So should our motive be the same. We don't deserve heaven. We deserve hell. But he's offered it to us. We are going to be very sorry one day if we block God's purpose in our life. If the gospel you receive does not produce fruit, you need to be alarmed. Jesus cursed the tree that bore no fruit. And do not wait until the day when you say I'm more ready or my priorities will be better or I have a different job. James 4.17 says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. The Bible never teaches that you pray a prayer with people and they're saved. We need to disciple people. We need to bring them into a walk with Jesus Christ. And I can't even tell you how many, on one hand, how many churches are even doing that now. They just count the number of prayers they get, but these people leave not even aware that they cannot go back to a life of sin. They don't even know that. No one told them that. The Bible does teach that we must walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because there are sins to be answered for differently than the ones we commit. It's the ones we omit. Omit means left neglected or undone. And if you're lukewarm or half-hearted about those that are lost here, that's going to be revealed in front of you on Judgment Day. God loving you will not fix that. He loves everyone, even those who choose to go to hell and not acknowledge him here as Lord. God would have never let Jesus suffer as he did if he wasn't so incredibly serious about this whole issue. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. Amen. He is not giving us a Savior-only option. There is nowhere that you can, many say, he's my Savior, I have not yet made him Lord. That is lost. There is no such thing. Jesus is Lord, or you are lost. Luke 6, 46 says, why do you keep on saying that I'm your Lord when you refuse to do what I say? We must develop God's heart in our soul, and time is nearly up, and the people that are watching all the end time events, now more so than ever, are sending me all these things. I tell them, you know what's different about me? Is that in my group of people, the end is coming every day. It always has. People that are addicted like I was are dying all the time. 
I don't live for this end that's coming to everyone. I'm watching all those dying right now. I'm already braced for the end almost every day because of somebody that I know is dying and going lost. And today is the last day for many. They won't be here tomorrow. The fentanyl epidemic is definitely showing us that. that this is the worst thing I've ever seen out in the drug culture. And if you can't bear to walk with and worship Jesus on earth, you definitely aren't ready for his soon coming. Don't cling to anything but him and his purpose for you, which is kingdom building. Let go of the greed, the desire for recognition, significance, any purpose that takes up more time than Jesus. Don't park yourself in front of your TV, get stuck on social media. I'm all about using social media to advance the gospel, but don't get stuck on it just for, because it sucks you in like a black hole. If you can't discipline yourself to do that, throw out that phone, get a flip phone, you can still buy them. Many tell me social media obsession is what took them away from their faith. They were, they came to Christ, they felt, but then when they got out of wherever they were and could have their phone back, porn and social media took them right down. They said it was immediate. And I say this over and over again. They thought they could handle it. They thought they could handle it. That'll be some famous last words for many people. I really thought I had it. First John 2, 15 to 17 in the Message Bible says, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love for the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important has nothing to do with the Father. It isolates you from him. First Thess Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, including pornography, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is honorable and holy, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all of those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject human beings, but God the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. The world and all it's wanting is on its way out, but whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. And don't be the one who is barely saved through the flames because God says they will have nothing eternal to show for their life here on earth. It will all be burned up on judgment day and you will have no reward. For eternity, you will have no reward. To choose to not obey God because it interferes with desires here, whether it's career, relationship desires, or even just laziness, is going to cost us such an enormous and very regrettable price on Judgment Day. Those you could have led to Christ are not in heaven because you didn't even care. You didn't even care to look for them. They went to hell for eternity, and some can be our own family members. The last days of America are definitely here. I think everybody can see that. You need to be intimate with Jesus so that your joy stays full. We don't have to fear what's coming our way. This hard falling down of what this country is experiencing is going to break out in revival. Their people are going to finally see the world is not going to hold them up. And then Jesus will be able to be heard finally. And this is certainly going to happen. And that's when those who were true Christians are going to shine like the sun. And those who were name only are going to panic just like the world and hopefully come to Christ. A real Christian does not stop talking about Jesus. Out of our hearts, our mouths speak. What you talk about is what you worship. And what we love naturally flows out in our conduct. And I know a pastor, I worked with one in the jails, who says often, I can eavesdrop on you for five minutes and tell you how full of Jesus you are. And he also says, if you're not eagerly watching for Jesus to return, he's not coming for you. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news of peace and salvation, the news that the God of Israel reigns. And I challenge you, count the cost of not standing for Jesus Christ. Everyone else is taking stands for every botched agenda possible. He says, take courage. And God has a fullness of courage.
courage for the asking. You won't get it if you don't ask, but if you ask, he'll give it to you. Courage and wisdom. Revelation 21, 6 through 8 says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give the springs of water and life without charge. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards who turn away from me, and unbelievers, and the corrupt, and murderers, and the sexually immoral, and those who practice witchcraft, and idol worshipers, and all liars. Their doom is in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Cowards will go to hell, right alongside murderers, sorcerers, the sexually immoral, and those that lie habitually, actually. And this should motivate us to exercise boldness to make Jesus Christ our sole desire and message. And we will never, ever, ever, for, we will never regret that decision, ever, for the rest of eternity. God has given each one of us a clear desire that he wants us to act on. I would say, don't say no to the one who holds your next breath in his hand. Say yes to Jesus. I'll close with Apostle Paul's prayer for spiritual empowering from Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. When I think of the wisdom and scope of God's plan, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will give you mighty inner strength through his Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now glory be to God. By his mighty power at work within us, he's able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare to have, ask or hope for. May he be given glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever through endless ages. Amen. 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 Precious Lord, thank you for this amazing group of people and the spirit that is in this church. I ask, I know you're coming to bring a revival to, these, to our area. I know you are. And if this be the place, let it break out here. Just have your way, Lord Jesus, amongst this precious group of people. Bless Tang. Bless him. And just continue to use this whole group as an amazing example of what you want this side of heaven. So bless them, keep them, protect them, provide for them, and continue to grow them and do miraculous things in their midst. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wow, that was really, really powerful. Let's give Wendy another round of applause. Here. God is so good. I love your testimony. That was that was so amazing. It, it, touched, it touches me dearly too, because I have I had a brother that still struggles with that at the moment with drug and alcohol use. So it, it touches me very much too. So I, I'm praying for him every day. So I just I just want to say that it, it means a lot to me as well. So. So, Jacob, appreciate you. Let's stand up and let us pray and close. Okay? Let us join hearts. What you pray, you got your little turkey, who got you? What you pray, you need to watch you, pray, you need to You know, we, we sin every day in our lives, God. But, God, we, as Christians, you know, we you, you reminded us that through you, God, that your love, that everything is possible and that we can win anything that comes in our ways. Father, we still have a lot of work to do as a church. So Father, just ask and pray, Father, that your spirit will continue to be with us all, continue to guide us, God, so that we may continue to do your works for you and continue to reach to those who need help, Lord. 
just pray over each and every one today, Father God. Hallelujah. Lord, I just pray over Wendy and the words today, Father. Thank you so much. It was very encouraging, very inspiring, Lord. And just pray that you will continue to bless her and her ministry, and that they will continue to blossom. So they will continue to go and save those who need saving, Lord. And I just pray a blessing over them right now, Father God. So we thank you, Lord. And I wish you a blessing. I thank you, Lord. And I wish you a blessing. I thank you, Lord. And I wish you a blessing. I thank you, Lord. And I wish you a blessing. I thank you, Lord. And I wish you a blessing. I thank you, Lord. And I wish you a blessing. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone.